So if you have your Bibles in John chapter number 1, in verse number 1, it says, In the beginning, God. Y'all like that? In the beginning was the Word, and was the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. That is the word logos. Logos. It is <clears throat> a word that describes the divine God that we serve, the God of the universe. Logos means the expressed image of who He is for us here on, on earth, mankind. I'm going to have y'all's attentions wonderfully today because you're going to say, that guy's chewing on something up there. I am. Now, in the beginning was the Word. When is in the beginning? When, was, when did God begin? He didn't have a beginning. And he doesn't have an end. God is in eternity. So when it says, in the beginning was the Word, from the very beginning... God was there, but the express image of himself for us came when he created this thing that you and I know as time. I kind of describe it like a parenthesis. When God was there and he decided to create the earth and to put mankind on the earth, and, and he was there with them, but when sin came to Adam and Eve, the clock started ticking. And they begin to die. But before that, he was there. And he was expressing himself to us. Now, everything that is good, everything that is God, God wants for us. Amen? And God wants a relationship with us. So in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Literally, it was God. Because it is God's expression to us. How can we with a finite mind, know the infinite? How could we see the Almighty? How could we, who have eyes that only see this world, how can we understand the glory of the Almighty? God expressed himself to us. And that's the word logos, that word. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, always, and it was expressed for us. The Word was God. Now look in verse number 14. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God chose to come down to this earth and express Himself. It is His divine expression of who He is, His nature. And express himself to us. The only way that we could know God is to see him in some way. And that's when Jesus came to earth. God allowed the Virgin Mary to have the expression of himself inside of her. And she had a child in Bethlehem. And the baby Jesus was born. And he cried. Probably not much, but that's what babies do, right? And they had to feed him. And they had to change him. Y'all good with that? That's what happened. And they had to teach him how to talk. And they had to teach him how to walk. And they got to be a part of that. Listen, the one who knows everything, the omnipotent one, had still not walked it out on earth. So there's one thing to know, and there's another thing to experientially know. And Jesus, who, was, who knew all things, yet had to walk it out, had to live it here on earth. So that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. A couple of Wednesday nights ago, um, I, I talked about Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, and, and Paul was living in jail, as a matter of fact, and he knew that he could depart at any time. That means he could die, he could leave this earth. And that word depart was a unique word. 
because it means that he uh, lived in a tent. That's what that root word meant. He was a tent. Now, we have in this building a foundation, and we have walls, and we have a roof, and we think of that as being a, a permanent structure, but it's not, right? Everything that we have down here is temporary, and a, a tent, that, that, that word dwell is a military term that the commander, when he was speaking to his troops, when he would say, it's time for us to depart, they would take down the tents and they would get ready to go. And that is the same word that in John chapter 1, 1 verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt. The same word means to dwell in tents. It was temporary. He was here for a time. And he lived his life sinless. Jesus never told a lie. He never talked back to his parents. He honored them. He never coveted what someone else had. He lived with what he had. He never lied. He never coveted. He never stole from anyone. For 33 years, he lived sinless on the earth. And for no sin that he ever did, they didn't like him. They trumped up some charges, and he was taken, and he was put on trial. And he was found guilty, though he had never done anything wrong. He was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. He knew what we went through. And they yelled, crucify him. And he allowed it. And they beat him. They whipped him. They mocked him. And they took him up to this place called Calvary and they nailed him. They put spikes through his hands and his, and his feet. And he hung on the cross. And he gave his blood. He shed his blood. The perfect blood, sinless blood. And he said to his father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He paid the ransom for our sins. I could not pay for my salvation. You could not pay for your salvation. But Jesus made a way between sinful man and a holy God. And he gave his life. He died. And they took him and they put him in a tomb. But three days later, <laughs> gloriously, he came back to life. If Jesus had died and not arisen, he would have been like the rest of us. But someone had to be the commander of sin and death. He had to take back that life so that he could give life to us. And he lifted his hands 40 days later and he went back to glory. There he was in heaven, sitting down on the right hand of the Father, listening to our prayers, listening to our cries, doing what a Savior would do. So whenever a little boy or a little girl or a, a young man or a woman, a, a husband or a wife, an aged person at the end of their time here on earth, when that tent was tattered and torn, whenever any of them would pray, they would hear, he would hear and make intercession for us. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. You have been saved through faith. Yet not of yourself. It is a gift of God. God's grace means we could not pay the price of our sin. But he did. 
We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. But he's willing to give this free gift of salvation. So by his grace, we have been saved through this word called faith. Faith is knowing without seeing. Believing with the only evidence be being our believing and our trusting and our knowing. Now, how many of y'all understand electricity? We might have a kind of sort of knowledge, but to, to see it, to flip a switch and it flow out to those things. Now, I may not understand all there is about it, but I'm not going to sit in, in the dark until I do. How many of you have one of these? How many of you have a computer or a laptop somewhere? And you'll do things on it. That's got my, my granddaughter. She's sitting up in the balcony. That's her picture. And we can do all these things to it. And we may want to save something. We may want to keep something. And we'll save it. And people say, well, we're going to save it to the cloud. I know people that have actually said, yeah, it's just out there in the atmosphere. It's just, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. You take it and you save it, and there's a server somewhere that receives it. Aren't, I love that word server because that's exactly who our Lord and our Savior is. He's the one who came to serve. He didn't came to be served, but he came to serve. So you'll sit out there and you'll say, I'm going to save this, and boom. Now, my, that thing's not plugged into anything, but it'll find the place, and it'll be kept there, so when you want to find it, you can find it back there again. Now, how many of you were like this? I really want to keep this thing, so I'm going to hit save, and I hope I'll find it again. Amen? How many of you hit the save button, and you're like, I really hope so, right? Right? My wife has more pictures than you could imagine. Well, maybe some of y'all can't imagine, right? And we said, we're going to save it on the cloud. And she's like, I hope it don't get lost. Look, there's something better than that, right? When you give your heart and your life to Christ, he does an amazing work of salvation. Though you don't see him, right? He's there, and he catches it. And you don't have to know where he's at. He's everywhere. And he, he keeps it, and it's there for you so that when you need it, it's there. If you have your Bibles, look over in the book of Romans chapter 10. Y'all pray for me. My sugar's not up yet, but I'm working on it. I'm chewing. If this microphone can hear me chew, I apologize to all the people at home or the people that are watching me online. If you're here. Much. I'm sorry. Romans chapter 8, excuse me, chapter 10. We're going to look at verse number 8. Are you there? Say amen. Look in verse number 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Now it says, what does it say? The Word is near you. That's not logos that we talked about in John 1.1 1, 1 and in John 1.14. Logos means the very expression of the divinity for you. So God would come and make a way so that you could see the essence and the nature and the goodness of God. But this is a different word. When it says the Word is near you, it's not Logos, it's Rhema. Rhema. And Rhema is God's personal touch. God's personal whisper. God's personal word to you. Now, there's a lot of us who say, I believe in the Logos of God. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he left heaven and came to earth. I believe that he sinless li sinned a, lived a sinless life. I believe that he 
died on the cross of Calvary, and I believe that he rose again, and I believe that he ascended to heaven. You might believe those things, but trust me, the Word of God says that even the devil believes those things as facts, and it says that he trembles because of, he knows those things to be true. That doesn't make you a Christian. You can walk an aisle and sign a card. You can go up in the baptismal pool, and we can dunk you once or twice or ten times, and that'll make you wet, but it won't make you a believer. Those are things that happen after you're saved. So what happens to get saved? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. God, Rama, he comes, and as Revelation 3 says, he knocks at your heart's door. He convicts you of your sins. He draws you, is the word, to yourself, to himself. When um, I was a small kid, I began to know that I had sinned, and I began to realize that that sin had separated me from a holy God, but yet God came and drew me to himself, Ramah. He called me by name. He knew everything about me, but he wanted me to know that he loved me, and he wanted to save me. I wish I could tell you that I said yes to him the very first time that he called me, but I didn't. So what happened was in my life, I, I explained it like this. I felt like I was going to explode. I felt like there was a weight of my sin that was on my shoulders. But it was a thing of accepting Christ, believing and trusting and letting Christ save me. Look what it says in verse number 9. Verse 8 says, The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. The word confess there means to declare or to say the same thing. I've married a lot of people. A lot of couples will come to me and say, we want to get married and we want you to perform the ceremony. I say, okay. We go through all this stuff, but we'll have a ceremony. And, and I'll look at him and I'll say, repeat after me. By the way, he's not saying it to me. He's making his pledge to her. And I'll tell him the words to say, and he makes that pledge to her. Then I'll look at her and I'll say, repeat after me. And she'll begin to make that pledge to him. And they'll make their pledges to each other, and they'll give each other the, the rings. And there's still not one. There's still two different people. Matter of fact, they could walk out and just never see each other again. But yet, I'll say, upon your confession of your vows and repeating of vows to each other, and the giving of rings to each other, now listen to me now. I'll say, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Now, seconds before, they are not one. They are not husband and wife. But when I make that statement and I say, I now pronounce you husband and wife, it will take tens of thousands of dollars to break that thing up. What, what I will say in seconds, will have to, they'll have to go before a judge to get that thing annulled, right? Or to get that thing broken up. It's literally, at one time, they're just there, but then after I say, I now pronounce you, it's legal. It's a binding contract. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you confess with your mouth to Him. You declare those things to him. And it says, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. You pray a prayer of confession to God. 
You ask God to do for you what only He can do. You tell Him that you're a believer and that you will follow Him, that you give your heart to Him. You know what God says? God says, I hear you. I accept. You're mine. And the contract is made. And there is no court on earth that can divorce it. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. His blood will now cleanse you. He will write your name in the Lamb's book of life. He loves you with an everlasting love, and you are His forevermore. Do you hear me? What on one moment, on one side of it, on one side of it, you're not there yet. But after you trust Him, you confess Him, you believe in your heart, you ask Him to save you, on the other side of that, you are a child of God. A glorious transaction occurs. You're saved. You're saved. And one day, when this tent comes to an end, you'll have a home in heaven. You'll be with Him forevermore. Look what it says in verse 17 of that same chapter. So then faith, that trust, that belief, though you've never seen Him, you still act upon it. You're acting upon what you say that you believe. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That is the rhema. That is God's touching you on the shoulder. Let's say here, you're there and you're minding your own business and God comes up and taps you on the shoulder and says this, I love you with an everlasting love. And it means something. Now, I understand love, but to express it means everything. Up there in that balcony, my wife's out there. She's up there. And it's one thing to say, I love you. But when she says, I love you, it makes a difference. My granddaughter's also up there. My daughter's not here. She's teaching today. She's teaching ninth grader girls. But whether it was my wife or my daughter or my granddaughter, when they say, I love you, y'all know what I'm saying? It makes a difference. I'm on boys up there too, and I love him. And when he's, I'm not sure he says, I love you. He just like, he kind of says, love you. Y'all know what guys do. But it means something to me because he's mine, they're mine. By the way, I'm theirs. They know that anything I have is theirs. I'm there for them in every way I can be. To know that we have everything that comes from the Father, but listen, all that the Father's becomes yours as well. By faith, the rhema, the touching, the calling, and our accepting. This is the way of salvation. There is no other. There is no other. And there is no excuse. When the Holy Spirit brings the rhema to you personally, you can say yes and receive His salvation. You can say no. It's your choice. He won't force you to be saved. I used to say there was yes and no and there's wait, but that's a no. You either have to say yes or no. Because you may say wait and never get another opportunity. The God of the universe that gives us every breath, there is going to come a point in time that we're going to come to the end of it. And we're going to, our heart will quit beating and our decisions will be over. It's either yes or it's no. You may say, I don't like that. Well, when the God of eternity 
speaks in time. We make our decisions in time. But when we get into eternity, it's done. You either will hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come home into the place that I have prepared for you. Or if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you will go into a place called hell where you will be separated from the love of God. You will wait until that judgment called the great white throne judgment and you will stand and your sins will be shown but there will be no redemption because you never trusted Jesus Christ. And you'll hear these words, depart from me. I never knew you. And forever and ever and ever and ever and ever you will be separated from the love and the joy and the peace and all of the logos, the expression of God for us. You'll be separated from ever, forever. You're without excuse. John 15 says this. John 15, verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now, they have no excuse for their sin. Romans 1, verse 20 says this. So, so they are without excuse. They are without excuse. You can either receive the gift of Christ or you're on your own. And if you can get but and you stand before that great white throne, you say, but, 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 he's going to say, no excuse. No excuse. You had an opportunity to hear the rhema, the word of faith, in your mouth, there in your heart, but you must accept it. It's up to you.